Yes, yes. You can start. No. So, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone and are present here in this uh, special session uh, today. I, on behalf of uh, the ADN Hub India, uh, which is hosted by the Odisha State Volunteers and Social Workers Association, welcome to you all you know, to this important uh, event of today. I request Dr. Ambika Prasad Nanda, who is the global advisor of this Avoidable Deaths Network, as well as uh, the advisor of Odisha State Volunteers and Social Workers Association, to deliver uh, the welcome address uh, to this gathering uh, today, those who joined virtually as well as physically in our office. So, yes, yeah. Yeah. good evening, everyone. Uh, I think Namaste from India. So, all of you who have joined uh, at different time zones, uh, I essentially wish you a good day. And uh, it's really uh, a great pleasure to be associated with uh, ADN, Avoidable Death Network which works for the larger benefit of the human society. Death in any family or in any society is a huge uh, blow to the entire family or to the society. But the discourse about death is very limited. We just treat any death happening in any society, uh, be it uh, in, in terms of policy making or any kind of discussion, it's just, it just treated as a number. But the emotion attached to that uh, loss of life is never discussed. So I am really thankful to Dr. Nipedita and uh, Hideyuku who have taken this initiative to initiate this network at the global level to sensitize people who, who matters, who are coming up with policies to, to address the issues of death which can be avoided. So for today's session, uh, what we're going to discuss today is about the uh, deaths happening because of uh, snake bites. If you see the recent trends, like uh, as for the WHO report uh, over a period of 2000 to 2020, there have been more than 1.2 million deaths. And, uh, it, it, and if you see uh, in India alone, it, that is the number. And for year, uh, it comes to around 58,000 deaths per year. And uh, and most of it, 50% happens in the age group of 30 to 69. It means the death happens uh, in the family who are the primary income or not. So that comes as a huge blow to the entire family. And interestingly, uh, the recent study, which has shown also more than 25% of the death also happens uh, within the age group of 15. So the, uh, the, the death burden lies either uh, the younger with the younger generation or with the generation in the uh, working age group. It's primarily because uh, most, and it happens in the rainy season. And as uh, Odisha or India is an agrarian state country. So there, uh, when people are exposed to the farmland during the rainy season, not taking precaution or safety measures, it brings in death, snake bites, and it uh, results in death. So if you uh, have a look at the uh, overall trend and the death burden, like in the, the most uh, eight burden uh, states, which causes, uh, which brings uh, deaths because of the snake bites are Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Odisha, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Gujarat, and Jharkhand. And Odisha, on an average, experiences close to 191 deaths. So that's which can be avoided. And uh, the study also shows the 70% uh, in the snake bites, which happens every uh, at, at any point of time, 70% shows only envoenimation, that the venom is given to or, or, or stung to the body of the person who, who suffers from the snake bites. And if uh, immediate first aid or prevention can be taken, so we can always avoid the deaths happening because of the snake bites. So I think it uh, gives me a, a great opportunity to uh, share about the figures in India and Odisha. And also many of you who are attending today 
must have been experiencing the similar figures or the similar situation in your own countries and societies. So probably uh, this is a great opportunity to discuss and arrive at certain uh, conclusions or find out some path so that we all work together, not only sensitizing the policy makers, but at the same time, building the capacity of the communities so that the prevention is taken at the at the grassroots level so the at the community level if we sensitize we can always avoid the deaths happening because of the snake bites i think uh, with these words uh, i would hand it over to dr nibedita to take forward the session and wish you all a very fruitful uh, discussion and request you all to uh, participate and contribute in this important uh, discourse today how to avoid deaths arising out of the snake bites so over to you nivedita thank you thank you very much ambika bhai thank you dilip hello everybody my name is nivedita ray bennett i'm an associate professor in risk management based at the university of leicester school of business uh, dr hideki shiroshita hideki if you are there please um with your hand um, Doc, Dr. Hideyuki Shirita, Shiroshita and I founded the Avoidable Deaths Network in 2019. So uh, Lauren, if you can please share my slides. I don't know, the slides are not being uh, put up. So yep, I'll, Anusha's just putting them up. Okay, I'll wait for a few seconds. Uh, in the meanwhile, I would like to thank the audience who have joined us virtually and those who are attending this session from the ADN India Hub office in Bhubaneswar in Orissa uh, on this, for this very special session on challenges and opportunities to reduce avoidable snake bite deaths. This is our first event in a hybrid format. We have not done this before. So in the beginning, you saw there were a few technical hitches. So thank you very much for your patience. Um, this session was basically organized on the event of the International Snake Bite Awareness Day. So Anusha, if we could go to the next slide, please. And the International Snake Bite Awareness Day was on the 19th of September. Unfortunately, we had to postpone it um, at the last minute because the Queen's funeral was on that day. So we've had a few changes, sorry about that, uh, but some things are beyond us, so we had to postpone it. So thanks again for joining us today on the 30th of September instead of 19th of September. So we are celebrating International Snake Bite Awareness Day for the first time. The Awareness Day was launched in 2018 by the Global Snake Bite Initiative, Health Action International, and the Lillian Lincoln Foundation. The purpose of this initiative is to implement the WHO's global strategy to reduce deaths and disability by half by 2030. But the question is, why ADN is celebrating International Snake Bite Awareness Day? Now, I particularly don't like snakes. <laughs> I'm really scared of snakes. In fact, one may say that I have something called ophidiophobia. Uh, I cannot sleep if I see a snake's picture. So, and yet, here's the story. I was born in a small, tiny rural village of North Bengal in India. I grew up with snakes, snakes were everywhere. I was never far from snakes. And during my six month ethnographic field research for my PhD in the village of Torashahi in Orissa, snakes were again part and parcel of my PhD research and also of my participants' everyday life stories and more so during the time of disasters. In 2020, at the height of COVID-19 lockdown, Dilip, uh, our ADN India Hub host, sent me an email saying, Nibajita, you must read this newspaper article. And this article is fascinating because it is talking about snakes and the snake bite deaths. And at the time in 2020, um, the newspaper article mentioned that the snake bite deaths were the next major cause of death after flood related deaths. Now, it was, uh, it was quite a revelation for me. I know snakes have been around me, but I never realized that, in fact, they might be more dangerous than floods, cyclones, or tsunamis, or any other natural hazards. So from 2016 to 2021, 
we found that more people died from snake bites than cyclones, floods, lightning, fire accidents, and boat tragedies in Orissa. Now, Orissa is my research state. I have been studying and doing research in Orissa since 1999. And also we have the Indian India Hub host, uh, Indian India Hub in Orissa. So Orissa is very close to my heart. Now, the, according to the latest annual report on natural calamities 2020-2021, published by the Revenue and Disaster Management Department of the Government of Orissa, more than 1,000 deaths were attributed to snake bite deaths across 30 districts, whereas deaths from lightning and floods only accounted for 329. So reducing deaths from snake bites therefore became the mandate of Indian India Hub. To say the least, other than my personal experience of encountering with snakes in my village in West Bengal and in my research village in Tarashahi in Orissa, I really don't know much about snakes, nor do I know much about snake biters. So to develop my knowledge, we organized a special session on 15th of December 2020 at the Gorilla Conference in Makarari University in Uganda. There we invited Professor Prabhat Jha from Toronto University and the PI of the Million Debt Study. This is probably one of the largest debt study in this planet, I would say so. And the snake man of India, Mr. Gauri Shankar. Um, Anusha, it's all right if you can stay on the previous slide, please. After that, I spoke with Dr. Kailash Chandra, who is the director of the Zoological Survey of India on 15th of December 2020, to learn more about the challenges related to governance for snake bites. <clears throat> Today, I'm very pleased to say that I've just completed uh, supervising two MSC dissertation projects on snake bites. Uh, initial plan was that both of my supervisors will present their studies. Unfortunately, one of them is in the hospital. So we have Nimisha who will be presenting her findings from the state of Orissa on the causes and circumstances of snake bite deaths. And today also we have this very special webinar with some of the world's renowned scientists and practitioners. Therefore, the past couple of years, has been nothing but a meaningful journey of crossing continents, countries, and disciplines in the search for learning and listening from some of the world's best experts and practitioners in the field. Now, according to WHO, unlike many other neglected tropical diseases, snake bite is entirely avoidable through preventable, treatable interventions, and effective governance. Yet, eight Indian states, and I don't want to repeat the names, Ambika Bhai has already done it, they're largely concentrated in the eastern part of India, central part of India, and a bit towards the western part of India, which is Gujarat and Rajasthan, carry nearly half of the world's burden of deaths and suffering. And what is fascinating about snake bite death is that the majority of deaths occur in rural areas, nearly 94%, and at home, and half of all deaths occurred in June to September during the Southwest monsoon seasons. Now, this season is notorious for flooding in the subcontinent. The latest World Bank group, Climate Risk Country Files, projected that even under lower emissions pathways with the Paris Climate Agreement, nearly all Asian countries, all Asian countries, are going to face an increase in the frequency of extreme river flows. Now, this has severe implications for the disaster risk reduction community, as well as public health and epidemiologists, and amongst others. Partly because the snakes are very much connected to the environment. A study conducted by Alirol et al. in Bangladesh they found that snake bite was the second largest cause of death in the 2007 floods in Bangladesh. In my PhD study conducted in 2002, from 2002 to 2006, a, a couple of decades ago, I found that snakes appear everywhere during the time of floods. And they take a board in dry places and on the roofs and doors because the flood water enters the snake holes. Floods therefore increase the likelihood of snake-human interaction and exposure to snake bites. According to Bimal Kanti Paul, snake bite is a more common cause of flood deaths 
in developing countries. So on this very special day, we have been really, really lucky to have some of the best scientists and practitioners on how on, on preventing snake bites. So we have Dr. Surajit Giri from Dimo Rural Community Health Center from Assam, Dr. Sudipta Ranjan Das from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Bhubaneswar, Dr. Omorendro Mohapatra and Dr. Subrat Palo from the Indian Council of Medical Research, Bhubaneswar, Dr. Nishant Saxena from Indian Council of Medical Research, North Jabalpur, and Dr. Matthew Lewin, one of the founders of the International Snake Bite Awareness Campaign. The expert panel will tackle some of the difficult questions of the second half of the 21st century, such as what is the future of this snake of this forgotten or neglected tropical disease? What is the future of the snakes in the context of climate change and increasing numbers of climate-related hazards? Are they going to thrive or extinct as the environment heats up due to climate change in India? Can the agenda of reducing this preventable death be kept alive as India, not just India, the entire world grapple with the recovery efforts from the impact of COVID-19 and economic lockdown. And finally, how can the burden of suffering caused by snake bites be reduced? Because this is largely the disease of the rural and the very poor and vulnerable people. We will also use this special session to present the poster developed by our ADN junior champion, Orkunil Ghosh, and one of our future leaders, my supervisee, Nimisha Goswami. Now, before I invite our panel, let me introduce Avoidable Deaths Network very briefly. I will just quickly go through. So, Anusha, we can move to the next slide, please. So, Avoidable Deaths Network, or ADN, is a diverse, dynamic, inclusive, and global membership network of experts, researchers, practitioners interested in avoiding human deaths from natural hazards, naturally triggered technological hazards, and human hazards in low and middle and high middle income countries. ADN was launched in 2019 at the fourth Global Alliance Disaster Risk Institute Summit in Kyoto in Japan. We can go to the next one. So ADN is often misunderstood as an NGO. So ADN is not an NGO. ADN is based and led by the University of Leicester and Kansai University in Japan. Now, Leicester offers a flexible MSc program called Risk Crisis and Disaster Management, and I am the program leader. And Kansai University offers BA and BSc in Safety Science, and Hideyuki leads uh, one of those courses. So if you want to find out more about these courses, please feel free to email us. We can move to the next one. So what is the purpose of ADN and our existence, purpose of our existence? So ADN exists to help policymakers, researchers, and practitioners to make better decisions to save lives and reduce injuries to achieve sustainable development. Our purpose is aligned with the United Nations Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction's first two global targets. Target A is to re substantially reduce disaster mortality by 2030. Target B is to reduce substantially the number of people affected by disasters by 2030. Now, these two targets work in interface with three different sustainable development goals, number 3, 11, 13, and 17. ADN is now part of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction's Sendai Framework Voluntary Commitments. So we have a web page there up on the UNDRR office, um, Sendai platform. If you would like to stay updated with our activities, please feel free to do that. Otherwise, ADN has its own web page and social media outlets. So please feel free to follow us. So we can move to the next one. So what do we do to achieve our purpose and vision? So ADN currently has six interrelated activities and these activities are in a way helping us to where we want to be. Now, given the constraint of time, I shan't go through all these three, six, six activities. It's already up on our website, but I think the first two uh, are quite interesting, which is related to the special sessions. So we can move to the next one. So just a quick one little bit on the special sessions. So the special sessions were first launched on 4th December 2020 at the International Conference at Makarari University in Uganda. And today's special is the 11th special session that we have run since 2020. The 
aim of these special sessions are twofold. First, uh, to, uh, we try to you know, exchange knowledge uh, uh, through these webinars, and they are, these webinars are delivered virtually, except for today. For the first time, we have done it uh, through hybrid um, platform, and this um, knowledge exchange webinars are free for the public. We don't charge, and the aim is to raise awareness on the concept of avoidable debts and their avoidance through theoretical or practical solutions or both. And then also the second aim of this special session is to raise awareness on those debts that are not often, that, that often not on, on the mainstream agenda of policymakers, practitioners, and even academia. For instance, our previous sessions have raised awareness on debts from nutritional crisis, from dog bites, uh, scavenging. We've also done debts from drowning, and today's session is on snake bite debts. The next one, please. And if you would like to join ADN, please join us. There's the link, I think, or Kunil, if you could drop the join in link of ADN on the chat yes. box, please. Yes. Thank you very much. And, um, and also we have, as I mentioned, a link web page on the UNDRR's platform. You can follow us there. We have Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Please feel free to join and follow us. Uh, and finally, the next slide is that we are actually we 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 are currently capturing the impact of our special sessions. So for this, we run two polls, uh, and we will launch the first poll now, and the last poll will be launched after the last speaker and the Q and A has taken place. So Hideyuki, um, with that note, I will pass if you could introduce, or do you need a few more seconds? Uh, well, uh, our uh, next uh, speaker uh, is, is Master Arconel Ghosh. So Arconel Ghosh is a junior champion, intern for special session. He is a 13 years old student from Mumbai, India, attends Jamnabai Nasi International School. He has been a junior champion with ADN since 2020 and has been regularly contributing articles to raise awareness in the society about sanitation, education, and pollution. He has been working as an intern, raising awareness about drowning deaths since June 2022. During this time, he researched the topic and conducted interviews with people from various countries around the world to better understand the risk of drowning deaths. He is a polyglot and avid coder. He can think and communicate in English, Hindi, Bengali, Mandarin, Spanish, Marathi, and Japanese, though only at a basic level. When he is not studying, Arconil enjoys reading detective and crime novels. He firmly believes that in order to change the world, one must first change one's attitude. So, uh, is it Arconin? Yes, it's me. Are you able to hear me? Okay, so I'll begin. Okay, so hi there everybody. So, as you might have known, my I'm Morpunil and today I'll be talking about seven ways, seven steps on how to prevent snake bites. So if you often go on trekking, you should always be wearing long pants and wearing boots so that the snake cannot bite you. And trust me, it always works. Secondly, whenever you're going out at the night or in the day, mostly at the night, you should take a stick with you so that the snakes can go away. So like, it'll be way easier for you. And if you're stopping for the night, like if you go out for a camp, if you go outside your city, if you go out in the night for a camp, you should always be checking the ground before laying down your tent. It's very essential to do so so that you so that there are no snakes during the night. And for example, and during doing that, you should also be using flashlights because well, if you use flashlights, it'll be easier to see whether there are snakes around and you can also be safe. And if you notice any hole or a burrow, do not put your hand inside it. Often we might be intrigued by it, but do not do that because we do not know who resides in there. Sixth, you should always be aware of the of your surroundings. So, like for example, 
if somebody lives in orisha they must be having a knowledge about where snakes uh, like where the where there are snakes mostly where there might be snake death and if you have that knowledge it'll be easier when you may you may be going out and lastly if you're traveling outside you should always you and you should always travel with a local guide the local guide has a lo lot of knowledge and he or she can help you thank you Great, Dr. Giri, and he has been working uh, with a goal for zero deaths from the snake bites in Assa. So, Dr. Giri has uh, treated uh, thousand more than thousand snake bites victims, and he promotes uh, public awareness of snake bite management. I think this gives us the right opportunity to learn from Dr. Giri. Over to you, Dr. Giri. Thank you. We're just loading Dr. Geary's um, video. Uh, please pay my recording video. This is our community health center, uh, the 50 weighted hospital, and there are nine numbers of the doctors, and they have. Uh, I have to. Um, uh, administer anesthesia for 40 numbers of the average of 40 numbers of the cesarean sections per month. Uh, it is said that uh, India is a capital of snake by death. We have around highest numbers of the death uh, in, in, uh, around the world. And uh, there are many causes. And what we have found that the people, they have more feet on the feet healers than the medical systems. They do not come to the hospital. And even some, uh, the small numbers of the patient who comes to the hospital and they are not uh, welcomed well. And uh, many a time they are referred from one center to the other center because of uh, lack of training of our healthcare workers and the, the, our healthcare workers are scared to inject the antivenom, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we want to solve these issues, that is the snake bite related deaths, then we have to inject antivenoms at community level. We have to treat the snake, the snake bite victims at the community health center level because the snake bite is a medical emergency of the poor and it is a medical emergency of our farmers. And the rural hospitals should be empowered, should be equipped, and they should treat those victims. Then only you can reduce the snake bite related deaths. Now, it is easy to say that we have to treat the snake bite victims in the community health centers, but we do not know the status of the community health centers of India or the globe. Now, this co in community health centers, there are one or two doctors. And this is uh, in, in, in odd hours, suppose in the night shift, there is only one doctor and one nurse or one technician. Now that doctor have to look after the COVID patient, they have to look after the fever patient, they have to look after the road trick of accident, and they have to look after the normal deliveries also. And at that moment, if a snake bite victims with a neurotoxic symptoms comes to uh, the hospital, the doctors and the nursing staffs, they become lost. And ultimately, they are, they are, the, they are clueless about the treatment of the snake bite victim and they transfer the patient to higher center on the way patient dies. And this is the scenario, ladies and gentlemen, and this is the truth, bitter truth. So what is the solution then? Our patients keep on dying about because of the snake bite. So we have tried to form a model. And before that model, model you can see in the year 2008 itself, I, am the, I was the person who have referred this patient. And it is not the same patient, but it was like this patient only. You can see a broken neck sign, you can see there, no muscle tone, patient has ptosis, she has dysarthria, and she has in the semi-conscious state. And these patients, I have referred the patient uh, to higher center and on the way she died. Because at that time, I have no clue. Our medicine people has also no clue what to do and what not to do and how to approach these victims. And that traumatized me a lot and given me input uh, means impulse to work on this subject. 
So uh, in our community health center, do uh, I am working on this subject from 2008. But from 2018 only, I have uh, started aggressively in my community health center. And my, our model is uh, forms from uh, the community awareness. This is the community awareness. We went to the small communities and I tried to bring those uh, people to the hospital after the snake bite. And we selected one or two person from these communities. We have trained and then we selected one person and we have included in a WhatsApp group. And this is a public WhatsApp group. So this is called a, this train pub people are called a venom response team. There is a VR3. Now, because of the awareness, the patients will definitely come to the hospital. But our hospital is not equipped enough. Community health centers are not equipped enough. So uh, if the patients comes at odd hour, where is the, the doctors and the nurses becomes lost? Where is the antivenom? Where is the adrenaline? Where is the hydrocortisone? Where is the air equipment? Where is the oxygen? Where is the ambu bag? So everybody becomes lost. So to give the strength to our healthcare workers, we have created a room that is called a snake bite room, which is a two bedded room. And where we have put all the medicine, you can see the antivenom, adrenaline, uh, this ambu bags and uh, isels, et cetera, oxygen, everything we have put there, the basic equipment we have, we do not have any ICU, we do not have any ventilator, but we have at least the basic equipments. And then we have also put the, uh, displayed the venomous snakes of the Assam. Wherever the patient comes, oh, sir, sir, this is the snake, it has bitten me, means it is a pit viper. So, sir, sir, this is the snake, it has been bitten me, it is a black raid. And if they say, oh, sir, there is no snakes, uh, um, uh, the, none of these snakes has um, bitten me, means it is a non venomous snake. So, it becomes easier uh, for our healthcare workers to treat those victims, ladies and gentlemen. So whenever the patients comes, and even in the moribund states, they directly come to the snake bite route, immediately the antivenom is injected. So there is no delay at all. So we have reduced the, that is from uh, symptoms to the uh, antivenom administration time. And then we have trained our healthcare workers. And these healthcare workers is called a FRT. There is a fast response team. Now this fast response team will detect and identify the danger signs of the neurotoxicity and they can easily inject the antivenoms. They can in, uh, treat the antivenom reactions and that prescription uh, we can you have displayed in the snake bite room. So if these are the symptoms and you give this um, uh, antivenom and uh, neostigmine and if the symptom doesn't improve after five doses of neostigmine, then it probably it is a creed, then go for the calcium gluconate like that. And also uh, we have displayed the uh, uh, how to manage the antivenom reaction so uh, so that our healthcare workers everybody everybody can uh, treat those victims even at the odd hours uh, and uh, uh, this snake bite room is giving the strength to our healthcare workers strength to our doctors strength to our nurses strength to our top technicians so this is the novel concept uh, you, you, uh, and this is the first in, in India and we have introduced and implemented this in, uh, we have started this from in 2020 itself. So post, uh, as we are working on this subject and uh, and we found that after this model implementation, so in the 2018, after a snake bite, the patient went to the uh, fatilar, snake bite, fatilar, snake bite, fatilar, and then they come to the hospital. So at around 300 minutes or so. But now in 2022, this year, the time has decreased. Snake bite hospital. It means no, it, it previously it was snake bite fatilar. Now it is complete 360 degree turn. Now snake bite means hospital. Snake bite means hospital. So we have reduced from the bite to the hospital admission time to 25 minutes. Now, because of this extensive awareness program, the patient's turnover to the hospital increased. It was in 18, 19, 20, and 21, you can see the highest number of 464. And now up to 20th September, we have recorded 429 numbers of uh, snake bite victim admission. And from 2018 to 22, and we have a grand total of around 1067 numbers of the victims and highly venomous was 12.9%. And there is only one dead ladies and gentlemen who attended very late to us. And we have not referred any case to the higher center. So we have treated uh, neurotoxicity of around 25%, cytotoxicity of 13%, and hematotoxicity of 57%. And this is our uh, map uh, of uh, Assam. You can say initially, this is my place. Initially, we were alone 
but because of the, it is our all protocols are followed by all districts of our Assam and can Assam the our doctors and the healthcare workers are working on this subject and we have reduced the death rates almost around 70 percent than the previous year because of this uh, this combined effort and now the media has uh, published our uh, this model and uh, and they have discussed our model and this is uh, it leads to the uh, many uh, uh, public of our uh, of our of our state and see the lady uh, see the girl you can see um, uh, she was bitten by black snake so black snake uh, means our 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 uh, healthcare workers become very much alert black snake black color snake maybe a cobra maybe a black red or it may be a indian red snake so they put the cannula uh, to the victims and she immediately came around after half an hour and at around one and a half hours she developed early symptoms of the neurotoxicity and no that is the dresser who observed the early symptom patient has difficulty in deglutition and dresser um, identified it informed on duty doctor informed the nurses and immediately antivenom was injected and she recovered well you can see these, these are all daily wage worker uh, family and this is the, you can see uh, he has uh, traveled one part uh, by bicycle next part in the uh, in the boat and third part in the uh, two wheeler and fourth part in a four 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 wheeler that is in the ambulances so uh, this is the impact of the brt the brt people are helping the transport of the patient to the hospital and he has also faith that if he comes to this hospital he will get a uh, good uh, treatment at the same time the cost will be zero so because these people are a uh, daily uh, wage worker so we cannot um, uh, we cannot uh, give um, a burden of uh, economic burden to these families so because of this combined effort, we have around 464 numbers of the um, patient admission in 2021 and we have uh, we, we registered zero death in our center and even in this uh, 2022, we are registering zero death till now, ladies and gentlemen, because of this all combined effort from society to the uh, hospital. So we've, we formed the non-breakable chains from the bite brt uh, snake bite victims to the brt from brt to the our whatsapp group from whatsapp group to the doctors and the nurses and then when the hippo comes to the hospitals and there is a snake bite room immediately we treat so it is a non-breakable scene and because of this we are getting success ladies and gentlemen so these patients which i have to, we have transferred in 2008 but this is in 2022 and she was bitten by monoslet cobra and after you can see the broken neck sign and after bite by the cobra the the brt informed us and we become alert at the same time they send a photograph of the snake and it was in cobra so we are more alert and uh, she was scientifically transferred to the, our hospital within 30 minutes at around one hour she developed the neurotoxic symptoms the earliest neurotoxic symptom that is the dizziness as well as the vertigo and as well as uh, blurring of the visions and difficulty in the swallowing and at that moment we have injected the antivenoms we have injected the myostigmines and patient recovered slowly because you should remember that this cobra venoms acts as a, 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 a causes descending paralysis it causes first effects affect the cranial nerves and that is why we get the uh, symptoms like uh, this blurring of the vision difficulty and swallowing and gradually this paralysis descends so if it this paralysis affects the uh, intercostal muscles and the diaphragm that moment you may need the tracheal intubation and ventilation but in our patient patient came said early patient stays in the hospitals stays in the observations and then when she develops the earliest symptoms like death, um, difficulty in deglutitions doses or the drowsiness or vomitings or uh, there is a uh, blurring of the vision at that moment we are injecting the um, uh, antivenom and we are preventing the parallel this descending paralysis and that moment you see these patients are not requiring any intubations not requiring oxygenations we have just recovered with an antivenoms and the neostigmines and close observation ladies and gentlemen so this is the beauty of working in a team from brt frt to snake bite room 
So as we, we, we analyze that snake uh, awareness is the issues, we have to avoid our public and that is why we have written and short successful stories and which we have published in 19 September, that is International Snake Bite Awareness Day and where we have uh, put uh, that uh, how to prevent the snake bite, what is the importance of the snakes in the, in, in, in the, in the society and uh, 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 the successful treatment on how to come to the hospital and everything, everything in this, uh, it is like a short successful stories of different patients of the cobra crate and the pin viper, etc. And then we have published it and for the people, by the people and this big is dedicated to the society. This is, you can see uh, having uh, this smile and you cannot buy it, ladies and gentlemen. Th these are the these are the people uh, who are the poorest of the people and we have prevented our death, ladies and gentlemen. This is the boy and 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 he is the father of the boy. They slept with pin viper, green pin vipers for two hours in the bed. And uh, at one moment, there is a conflict between the snake and this uh, son and the father. And there is a severe coagulopathy, severe pain. They came to us and they recovered well. And these are the smiles they are giving the kick to us to work on this subject. And we are preventing a lot of death with a team effort. And I am very much proud of all of them because it is a team effort. Yes, I am the captain of the team, but we work together and prevented many, 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 many dead in our center. And if you replicate this model to every uh, uh, state of our uh, state of our uh, country or other country who has this uh, high uh, mortality and morbidity rate, then definitely we can reduce or prevent many deaths. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we can, yeah, over to you for Dr. Singh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. we can hear you. We can hear yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Giri, for the spectacular work, and uh, more importantly, uh, subsequently, the questions raised and discussed about once again reposing confidence with the community, as community is always the first responder, and especially demystifying the risk that the community members can always take the lead in uh, saving the life of the people and the same can be replicated in other locations. So thanks a lot for sharing this uh, learning with all of us. So now we have one uh, next presenter is an interesting uh, physician. So I, I invite Dr. Sudipta Ranjan Singh. Dr. Uh, Singh is an additional professor at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Bhubaneswar in the Department of forensic medicine and toxicology and if you have a look at the career of dr singh you would you, uh, you would be really uh, very interested uh, to hear more about what he has been doing and especially on the snake bite dr singh's research focuses on uh, human snake conflict he is an expert on forensic toxicology pathological autopsy cadaveric organ retrieval uh, like saving the life of the people once again and more importantly, he is an expert in crime scene reconstruction and death investigation. So I think uh, it would be very interesting this evening to uh, listen to Dr. Singh. So we have him uh, in, in, uh, physically, he is present over here. So I would uh, invite uh, Dr. Singh to come here and share his presentation. So Dr. Singh, please. Yes. So good evening, uh, everybody. Yeah. I know we are at different time zones here uh, in Bhubaneswar. It's evening. So <clears throat> anyway, have a good day and good evening. Uh, I am Dr. Sudipta Ranjan Singh. My topic of presentation today is uh, reducing burden of snake bite deaths in Odisha. Aims uh, approach through science and uh, social science. Uh, so in the next ten minutes, I will uh, briefly highlight. Uh,
uh, how the aims being one of the institutes of national importance and a premier institute right, is focused uh, on the primary mandates of it to reduce the disease burdens of course the other, other mandates are research and uh, patient care so i briefly focus on that so the topic is itself divided into two aspects one is uh, the scientific interventions and the social interventions uh, i will start i am a uh, medical teacher as well uh, i do teach uh, mbbs students along with uh, being a forensic expert i have to investigate the different death uh, scenarios also so what i have observed uh, during uh, the last 10 years period that uh, the snake bite uh, identification of snake the problem of snake bite and management of snake bite is usually taught at the level when the students are in the second year of their mbbs so you know here in india this is a four and half of your scores so they are basically taught about the toxicology and snake bites and uh, identification of snakes at the level when they are second years and they get a clinical exposure after completion of four and half years during their internship and after that they are uh, licensed to practice what i had ob observed that most of the medical textbooks when they follow are having uh, the data which are not updated actually and there are many small mistakes which is i mean uh, which could be dangerous when practice this is not appropriate update updated just take the example of uh, tonicant in the uh, indian guideline it has been clearly spelled that tonicant should not be applied in the indian condition because we don't know what we do is uh, dr giri can understand people usually tie a, i mean a rope or some uh, cloths very tightly to obstruct the flow of blood completely like that so <clears throat> this is something that uh, that resting and all those uh, lymphatic obstruction along with that here what happens the circulation itself stops so that we have observed and published in a uh, scientific paper also this is not about the tonicant only there are different limb adorning ornaments also that need to be removed so the first observation is mine was that actually the curriculum need to be modified at when the students are actually getting the idea about how the snake uh, bite cases should be managed so in aims because aims is autonomous institute we have uh, we design our own curriculum so what we have done is we have uh, i mean take the best things about different textbooks and by direct demonstration of uh, things we try to i mean uh, upgrade our students knowledge of how to address or how to treat, treat this snake bite uh, Yes. So that was quite a fruitful thing. Over the last five years, we are practicing this thing. We are uh, actually trying to horizontally and vertically integrate integrate the subjects. Like they are taught about the snakes in the second MBBS, or and they are taught about the management in the final year. So what happens by the time they taught how to manage the uh, snake bite cases, they are already forgotten the morphological identification things about the snakes. so we have in the second mbbs uh, level when they are in so we have started the vertical integration that simultaneously the teacher of forensic will teach how to identify the snakes we take the help of snake helplines few of the times they have their charts and all those things they have the lot of practical experience they come to our uh, uh, hospital they also become a part of the teaching system and simultaneously identification management everything is taught in one or two classes so that the students get a holistic idea about the treatment then <clears throat> another one thing in the scientific approach we have done is different ic materials we have distributed not only to the aims to the different hospitals around the ic material is developed with the help of the snake helpline that the exactly the same way dr surjit has presented that these are the locally uh, available or locally predominantly venomous snakes so the charts are prepared and it was distributed to the nearby tertiary center sp medical college and to the capital hospital so that whenever a patient is brought to the emergency the physician who is over there they can readily identify and the patient himself can identify yes this is the snake and this is whether venomous or non venomous so this endeavor we have started in uh, 2017 yes 2017 and all the peripheral hospitals around the city of bhubaneswar so we have distributed that ic materials then <clears throat> we had a scientific study on the, the, the that i was pointing about that 
yes most of the time people are not applying this tourniquet but here you know the hindu uh, people they never remove the i mean the bangles they have some uh, thread sacred thread attached to the i mean their hands which they never remove a married woman never, never married woman never removes that whatever may be the condition we have observed that when there is a bite to the limbs this limb adorning ornaments or the threads are actually behaving as a tourniquet when the limb is swollen so we have collected i mean quite a lot of cases and published it also that because you know the plaster management says that uh, geoserans immobilize but there was nothing uh, regarding removal of the ornament so we have proposed to recorrect it as per reassurance as well as removal of the ornament now uh, this thing has been adopted in some areas also so that was a i mean in fact uh, how uh, i mean this scientific intervention can change the practices then what we have done is we have seen that odisha is a predominantly agricultural and there are a lot of areas i mean of um, uh, tribal areas where there is uh, a poor connectivity and a young doctor is usually posted in those tribal areas usually experienced doctors are at the i mean the senior level doctors or specialists are available in the capitals or the major cities but in the tribal areas the doctors are not i mean young doctors go so we what we have done is we have uh, prepared a whatsapp network now this smartphones are available everywhere so this whatsapp network is connected with hundreds of doctors across odisha uh, those who are placed very remotely so whenever there is a snake bite case they usually click the picture or if they have any management related queries also they put in the whatsapp so whoever in the cities or whoever is alert they usually give a reply so that the remotely placed doctor also guides the treatment appropriately and every day and other 24 hours the team is on it and we are addressing hundreds of queries of uh, remotely placed doctors and different things uh, on the whatsapp group so that is a quite a beneficial thing and actually an advantage of technology we are uh, presently uh, uh, taking then regarding this uh, uh, social aspects social interventions by ms bhubaneswar uh, because two prongs are there one is scientific intervention and other one is the social intervention yes this is definitely uh, one of the major uh, thing we have understood because snake bite is a problem uh, without social interventions the, there won't be any paradigm changes or over i mean this uh, particular thing here in odisha we have seen that uh, over the years the snake bite deaths are gradually i mean reported deaths are gradually increasing probably last year it was nearly 1000 some odd deaths and this year probably 900 some odd deaths were there so all the social intervention we have uh, tried the first thing is uh, that uh, already we are discussing during uh, dr girish topic that yes there are faith healers that is also here in odisha that uh, or that thing also they are facing very badly he usually has a habit because this is a age old and i mean generation old practice that whenever there is a snake bite the people will take it to the nearest mandir or to a faith healer whom they believe that he can cure this element yes exactly scientifically we know that only i mean 12% in 1000 deaths that dr giri have cited is very few numbers are actually venomous bites if at all is a bite by venomous snake also it could be a dry bite so that is the reason why the fed the healers have so much popularity and trust gained by the people so what we have done is we uh, with the help of the snake helpline which is a voluntary organization in here in odisha who have i mean agents uh, you can say angels everywhere every rich and corner of odisha many districts are covered so what we have done is they are basically engaged in rescues so whenever because they are also rurally and in their areas they are quite popular because they can handle snakes they also get calls when there is a snake bite what we have done is we have trained them uh, how to give the faster what is the faster management is if they are brought to the side then what could be the basic life support they can give and that's why we have organized a training session for the snake rescuers all over the odisha we have done that then simultaneously uh, i have personally conducted a institute sponsored study about the knowledge attitude and practice of uh, on the people where there is a snake intrusion and this study is on the i mean the persons where there is a snake intrusion is there so know whether they could identify the snake are they knowing how to prevent intrusion of snakes into their household and are they knowing if there is a snake bite what they should do 
the i mean the study is now completed we are analyzing the data in the, i mean couple of months or in months so this data will be uh, uh, will be public and we are going to publish that there are very interesting findings so both the studies conducted in the city of bhubaneswar still we have observed it say i mean the capital city and the population is as such very educated but yes there are a lot of myths which is still prevailing this uh, i mean uh, quite strong in this educated population also then another thing we have developed is a snake helpline app this is a app dedicated to the public uh, around uh, your back what is this app is this is android and this website also you can access this is snake helpline app here anybody can have the basic knowledge about the identification of the snakes so what are the faster things and how to i mean what are the faster things he should do and he should also know can know the don'ts about the snake bite because there are a lot of things you shouldn't practice when there is a snake bite just for example you should not wash it like a dog bite case you do because that will increase the spread of the venom similarly there are a lot of don'ts also that you can get an idea this is dedicated already dedicated to the public then recently uh, the social aspect uh, i have been invited by the state state disaster management authority who is also bothered about this increasing number of snake bite deaths uh, i mean odisha and they are promised to how to cotton it down so they are the working group we have uh, i mean discussed many aspects so there are few i mean interesting uh, things which uh, was uh, quite practicable like the anti venom stock monitoring in the different sectors that is in the pipeline that is also going to come very shortly then recently two days back we had also organized a snake bite awareness campaign in our hospital this is a regular thing we are doing so all sorts of in the scientific aspect as like the social aspect the ems movement sir is committed i mean to give its best so it's already time up thank you probably i have lost few more seconds so that's all from my side thank you all So, thank you, thank you, Dr. Singh. I think Madhu is, is Ambika Bai is come. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Singh. I think it's a lovely presentation, and uh, the way they, they have developed the network, so that is uh, not only helping the young doctors, but also actually they are able to reach out uh, with the expert knowledge of uh, like. Uh, experienced faculties from all india institute of medical science to the various rural locations so i think it would be really good if we have uh, one or two questions to dr singh uh, otherwise then we'll proceed to the next uh, presentation ambika bhai it was just an exception for dr giri the q and a session is after dr L matthew lewin's session so there will be a q and a session so we can move okay, on okay, to okay okay so okay so uh, I think uh, thank you, Dr. Singh, uh, yes. and we'll just wait for some time for the question and answer session. So right now, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, so I'll be waiting for the question and answer sessions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ambika, bhai, can, uh, can you please switch uh, mute your uh, mic because it's making a bit of noise. Yeah. So, um, so the next speaker, uh, unfortunately, we don't have them here in the Zoom meeting, but uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce them. Uh, Dr. Amarindra Mahapatra, who is a medical anthropologist within the head epidemiology division at the Indian Council of Medical Research, Bhuvaneshwar. In addition to snake bite epidemiology, Amarindra works is in the field of epidemiology of tuberculosis, malaria, filariasis, and nutrition. His goal is to achieve the targets of the national health programs at the faster rate in the interest of the state. And at the same time, we have another speaker, Dr. Subrata Kumar Polo, who is a scientist at the Indian Council of Medical Research, Bhubaneswar. His area of work include epidemiology, public health, maternal health, and nutrition. And uh, it's an apology from Aden India due to some unavoidable circumstances. They are not here with us, but we have the leaflets, which we usually like the, it is circulated in Indian villages, rural villages. So I request Dr. Dilip to share the screen and show the 
uh, leaflet and I think Dr. Ambika is also having the same leaflet that is circulated in Indian villages for a vanish. Madhu, if I may, I can add a little bit. So, ah, we've got Dr. Mohapatro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just got him. We oh, found him. He is now yeah. here. So thank okay. you so much. So we will be, we will go ahead with the presentation. So Dr. Mohapatro has joined. So thank you, Madhu. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahapatra, for saving us. <laughs> Please, the floor is yours. Yes. Are you there, Dr. Mahapatra? Subrata ji? Yeah, so Doc, Dr. Mahapatra, actually, you need to give access to your camera. At the moment, you have, you just need to click on it. Maybe, um, Madhu? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we give a few minutes to Dr. Mahapatra to settle down and, and in the meanwhile, we could invite um, Nishant maybe. What do you think? Yeah, maybe yeah. I, I think Dr. Mahapatra is having some problem. I think he's just given access oh, to the camera. No, the... Yeah, yes, you can start. Uh, welcome all. I know very few people uh, in this group. So I am Dr. Uh, Amrinder Mahapatra. Me and Subrat, Dr. Subrat Pal, we are uh, managing this project on ICMR snake bite project on capacity building of health system to pre on prevent and management of snake bite innovation, including its complications. <coughs> Next. This project, uh, this project is uh, we are doing it in uh, two districts. Next one. This, uh, the objective of the project uh, are clearly mentioned here. We are in, we are trying to increase the awareness and one pen and empower the community on prevention. Uh, with first aid and early uh, transport of snake bite patients to the nearest health facility. So for that, the medical uh, we are training the medical officer <coughs> and other uh, health management staff for, uh, regarding the snake bite management of ASB and distribution of system in the public facility to in both the districts in Raigada and at Korda also to empower the health system of for management of snake bite innovation and optimal utilization of anti-snake venoms through implementation of standard treatment guidelines of government of India. Government of India has got standard, uh, everybody is aware of that, the standard treatment guidelines. So we are ensuring that I mean, for that, most of the health staff we have observed, they are not well aware of. We are bringing them to the mainstream to study the impact of capacity building on health system on reducing the mortality and mortality due to snake bite animation in selected district of Maharashtra and Odisha. This project we are doing it in both the states. Next. So in Maharashtra, we are doing it in Sahapur and Aheri block in Gadchiroli. And in East Odisha, we are doing it in Khorda and Raigada district. In Raigada, we are doing it in Kasipur block. 
Next. So the selection of the study site is based on the recommendation of the ICMR National uh, Task Force on Snake Bite. The sampling strategy was uh, uh, is implemented through the MRHRU of the we have got a MRHRU um, uh, system in uh, to facilitate the medical colleges in the geographical locations. So we are empowering them, the medical health staff. And the research tool for the proposed study will be developed, taking into the consideration the regional factors, the culturally approved IEC training manuals for uh, outreach health workers in regional languages, training manual for medical officers is, is, will be developed. The facility check assessment will also be carried out to understand the ASB distribution and utilization in selected regions of India. Interview of outreach healthcare workers like ASA, ANM, and MPW uh, and medical officers will be conducted to understand the knowledge gaps. In this yes. regard, uh, oh, hello. Yes, sir. The training, manual will, uh, the training manual will be prepared in Odia language for ASA, ANM, and all. Preventing that, that is a local dialect uh, for prevention, diagnosis, and management of snake bite uh, based on uh, the standard guidelines. Uh, IEC material uh, will be prepared in local language Odia that we have prepared one, and we will, uh, with uh, all your collaboration, I think we, we can also improve it for empowerment of the community and primary healthcare system to empower them on snake bite prevention, diagnosis, and management. The IEC material will be displayed in schools, Gram Panchayat. This is most important. Gram Panchayat, Anganwadi, TSCs, and RSDS, Ashram schools, and Panchayat Samisis, so that the community will be well aware of the steps they should take at each line of uh, uh, prevention and line of treatment. And in the capacity building of outreach health workers, ASA ANM MPW will be carried out. Uh, the capacity building of medical officers in bo both uh, and the corporate block will be carried out through regular training programs. Regular we have conducted the one point training program for all health workers and medical officers in both the districts uh, by the national snake bite trainer, Dr. Majumdar. Majumdar was here uh, one and a half month back and he has. Uh, done the conducted the training in Raigada and Khurda also. Now the retrospective data collection form, monitoring and evaluation checklist, prospective uh, snake bite management form. Next. Next slide, please. These forms are now available and the work is going on. And and uh, IEC and community meeting in public. Uh, and public talks, IEC meetings are almost all public talks are uh, we have to conduct that. And community awareness, education on risk prevention, snake bite, healthcare seeking behavior that we are carrying out phase, phase in a phased manner. And in both the districts, we are uh, doing it simultaneously because one is interior and one is nearby. Improved healthcare seeking behavior, early referral of ASB admission uh, is being checked at each step month wise and uh, data in this regard is being collected by the project staff and we are compiling it and reduction in snake bite mortality and morbidity will is being monitored but initially it will increase we hope that uh, since we are intervening and we are uh, since we are monitoring step by step uh, the reporting will be more nowadays so initially it will increase the mortal, mortality and morbidity uh, will I will number will also increase and uh, in as a result the mortality number will go down that is our expectation in the, at the end of the study next next slide please Uh, 
and that is the training component of ASP distribution utilization. Interview of ASA ANM is over. Interview of medical officer is also being uh, over, and assessment of infrastructure is going on now. It is in the pipeline. So once it comes, then we will go over the training component and evaluation of ASP distribution and utilization because. Assessment of infrastructure because they have a cold chain or not, they have uh, other things or not, just we are doing it. Next, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, this is regarding the uh, this activity we have just finished last uh, one and a half month back, and this is about the building of medical capacity building of the medical officers and all. The national expert. Uh, was here, and as I, I was mentioning, uh, we have uh, uh, we'll go to the next one, the uh, result one. We have conducted, we finished all the trainings of medical officers in both the districts. Next slide. Uh, uh, this is a periodic training of healthcare staff, uh, will uh, will again go on. So now. This activity is, we can say that uh, this is underway. We have finished only phase one because uh, one point of training we have conducted, and uh, IEC also we have given one point, and the other things we are uh, uh, compiling the data, and gradually we'll go the prospective uh, of snake bite management in a uh, prospective manner. Uh, periodic monitoring also we are carrying out. So supervision and quality control, all this data is going on. We are compiling it. We are not finished with it. Next one. Next slide, please. Uh, in, uh, in this short-term finalization of snakebite management protocol is over and empower the community and health system prevention and improvement management of snakebite in selected regions in India is done. And establishing centers and of excellence of snake management of the, the study sites he will be done on a, a long term basis on a later date. Reduction in mortality and morbidity due to snake bite insect regions to India will be, it can be achieved. Support of government of India. Uh, okay, thank you. Time's up. Okay, last slide, please. Time is up. La last slide, please. Huh. So these are the some of the results you can go. So IEC is ready, and these are the in both the districts. This is the figures we have uh, trained in gender-wise breakup, age-wise breakup is also there. So you can go through this. I think this is being circulated. This is an ongoing process, and we are uh, on the process of compiling the data. Thank you. Thank you, Amarindra, sir. That was very interesting. It is always nice to hear the uh, anthropologist and uh, especially the ground level work they do. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, I request all the participants to save their question. Our next speaker, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Nishant, who, he, who is also an anthropologist. And uh, let me introduce Dr. Nishant. So he is a scientist at the Indian Council of Medical Research. National Institute of Research in Tribal Health, Jabalpur, India. His present research focus is on the connecting, uh, connecting tribal traditional healer and their practices with the public health system in India. He is a member of IUAES Commission on Medical Anthropology and Epidemiology and served as an evaluator of NRDC National Award 2019 and NRDC TVDC program. 2021-22. Dr. Sakshina has contributed on a range of issues of anthropological relevance to participation in academic discourse like conference, seminar, etc. And though and through numerous publications in peer-reviewed journals, with notable ones begin being in the journal The Lancet. So recently his work got published in Lancet. So I welcome Dr. Nishan to uh, start his presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope I am audible to everybody. Yes, you are. Uh, so very good evening and uh, also good afternoon to some of the participants here. And uh, 
uh, I, before I commence, I must thank the core team of uh, of the ADN, uh, Dr. Nivedita Bennett and uh, Dr. Hideyuki Shiroshita, Dr. Madhurika Sahu, and especially Dr. Ambika Prasad Nanda, who is organizing the event in Bhubaneswar. So thanks a lot to all of you. And let me just tell you that it's it has been an absolute privilege for me to be part of this uh, this uh, event today, where we have having very fine minds who are associated very closely with the problem of a snake bite. And but let me tell you, I must admit that I am a very novice person in this area. So we have just started a little bit working on this area, especially. Uh, in the tribal hinterlands, and uh, I will be showing why it is important to work in the tribal areas. So I think it's a great move to be talking about snake bites and snake bite deaths in particular at the regional, national, and international level, because I think that there is a lot of serious uh, lack of awareness about this whole issue. So as Dr. Nibetita was telling, we all are afraid of snakes, I think, and so so we just kind of want to keep away from them. But usually what happens that the animal is not trying to harm us, but we are rather trying to enter his, his or her domain. And that is how the human animal interaction begins. So I think there is a lot to be done in this, in the area of uh, raising awareness on snake bite. Uh, and I will be presenting very briefly a small study, a small qualitative study, which we have uh, recently concluded from one of the tribal areas of India. So in India, in Madhya Pradesh, there is a tribe known as Saharia. And so among the Saharia population, we did a small qualitative study. One of my students, she did a dissertation, master's dissertation. So she conducted a study there. And our focus uh, was on the snake bite and how, what kind of role the traditional healer is playing into this whole reality. So can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So as you can see, there are two maps here, one on the left and one on the right. The left, the left map specifically shows the, how the tribal population is scattered across the length and breadth of India. And on the right hand, we see what are the various, uh, I mean, what is the snake bite mortality risk in India geographically? So if you combine both the maps, you will see that all the tribal areas, except the Northeast, I don't know why it is not there in Northeast. I think it is a very good sign for us. And we need to learn something maybe probably from there. But uh, except the Northeast, the other tribal hinterlands of India, uh, the Madhya Pradesh, the Jharkhand, the Chhattisgarh, some part of the Gujarat, Rajasthan, Andhra Pradesh, all these areas have a lot of, uh, they are prone to snake bite mortalities. So we need to look at that what kind of connection is there between the tribal areas and the snake bite. I think that is a key if you want to move in this area further. And specifically because we know that there are studies which say that most of the deaths are taking places among the poor communities, among the rural dwellers, among the agricultural workers and also among the children. So children are also there. So a lot of times uh, the children are getting bitten by snake and not being treated on time. Uh, next slide, please. So our work was in the Saharia tribe. And the Saharia tribe is basically uh, concentrated in the Chambal region of Madhya Pradesh. So it has about nine or 10 districts where this particular tribe is, is scattered. But we worked in the Shivpuri district and that too in the Pohri block. So there is, you must, we must all be remembering the recent event of the cheetah event, which India had. We have brought a lot of cheetahs to India. The Kuno National Park, where the cheetahs have been brought, that is essentially a Saharia area. That is where the Saharias traditionally have been living. And that is by the, the meaning of word Saharia is actually companion of tiger. So that is how they connect with the, with the cat family. So, that area, this Pohri area is actually very close to the Puno also. So this is where the Saharias are living and we found that the Saharias are still quite dependent on the forests for different, different reasons. And their hamlets, which are known as Saharana, are mostly located close to the forest. So there is a lot of potential of human-animal interaction 
that leads to a lot of different kinds of animal bites. So it is not just snake bite. It is also scorpion bite there. It is also dog bite there. It is also other kinds of bite. But we will be focusing on snake bite today. So the Saharias are mostly landless. They migrate seasonally to different parts of India for earning their livelihood. And if you look at the present day pressing health problems among the Saharia, then the first one which comes up is tuberculosis. Saharias have the world's highest incidence of tuberculosis. It is almost 10 times the national average of India. And at the same time, the Saharias are suffering with malnutrition. And they're also, because of which or all these factors, there is a very less or, or a short life expectancy at birth. Okay, so can you just move to the next slide? So if you go to a Saharia area, the Saharana as they call it, what you will see, you will see that people are there. I mean, they are still, uh, the population is dwindling. The Saharia population is dwindling. That is why they have been kept as a PVTG. The PVTG is a special category of tribes in India, which has having a very low population. So Saharia is part of that particular group and they have a very low level of education. They are still sustaining by so-called the primitive uh, kinds of livelihoods. So they are going to the forest for collection of various forest produce. They are also serving as laborers. They are also, but the most important thing is that in their households, the, their, their typical Saharia houses, the bottom, I think in the bottom line, you can see this picture. That Saharia household is very gloomy. It is not having any ventilation. It is a single entry exit point. And, and along with the people, along with the Saharia people, their animals are also living there. Okay. So in the house, everybody is there. And there is also, if, if a snake comes in during the, let's say during the rainy season, then you won't be able to make out that really there is a snake sitting in the, in, in some corner of the household. So this is how they are living in those resource starts areas. And when I say resource starts areas, I also mean they are, they are not having good resource as far as the health infrastructure is concerned. Their health infrastructure is also poor in those areas. Yes, the government is doing lots, lot of things, but still the people are shying away from going to those centers. So we will see what, what's the reason behind that. Next slide, please. So these are some of the various species, the, the main six species of snakes in that area. Most of them are quite dangerous. Next slide, please. So when you, uh, as we have been uh, telling that in, in Assam also and in, and in Odisha also, the first responders are the traditional healers. And they are basically giving two kinds of, the, two kinds of healings they are doing. The faith healing, and the ethnomedicine or the plant-based ethnomedicine kind of healing. So the most important thing here is that the whole concept of snake and the DT associated with the snake is, is something which is very integral to the whole culture of the community. So they don't see snake bite as a snake bite. They, they see it as a wrath of the God. Okay. So the Teja Ji Maharaj, the God of the snake bite is highly revered in the community. And you will find those symbolic, uh, presentations across the various artifacts which they are using even a, a modern artifact like a bike or a car or a bicycle will be having the Teja Ji Maharaj symbol. So it is integral part of their whole community. So if somebody is saying that people will stop going to the traditional healer and will stop and will start going to the to the modern healthcare worker then I think it is still quite challenging in an area like a Saharia population where they are residing. Next slide please. So we met some of the traditional healers and, and these are some of the healers which are actually providing the ethnomedicine, the plants based ethnomedicine, which is actually working as antidote. So they are claiming a lot of things that, okay, our, our, our medication works. So we still need to kind of ratify how far that is helpful. Yes, there is, can we go to the next slide? I want to just, uh, yeah. So the most important thing is that you, we cannot, I mean, that is what my experience is that the, 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 the faith healing is very important from the cultural perspective, from the community perspective. So we cannot just tell people, show people some posters and that will stop. So there has to be some kind of active uh, 
uh, advocacy in the community and social mobilization to help us move out of that. Then the traditional healer, which is there, people have tremendous faith in the traditional healer. They believe that the traditional healer is sufficient and capable enough to handle snake bites, and they don't have much faith in the healthcare system and the healthcare professionals who are around them. So yes, we need to do a lot of things to instill that faith. And until that is done, I think the traditional healer will be having an advantage over the other professionals there. So, and uh, usually we think that medical pluralism is ex existing in those areas where these tribes are eating. What I feel is that it is not so. The tribal healer is the dominant healer for the community. So he is the one who is the first responder in most of the situations. So I think we need to empower him also. We also need to make him part of the whole system in some way. Maybe we can incentivize him if he channels the patient in a timely manner. Like Dr. Giri was telling that they don't want to come. They do, they do want to come. That is what I feel. They do want to come, but they must be getting something. See, it is part of their livelihood system. They are, they are rewarded in the community for doing this service. If they don't do this, there is nothing else they will be doing. So we need to give them options. We need to give them some kind of incentive if they are moving out of their whole circle and trying to help us. So people will be going to, to them. That is what we have found in, for the tuberculosis also. People want to go to the traditional healer. He or she is the first responder. But if we want to make people have faith in the public health system, then that public health system must reach the doorstep of people. It is not possible that when the person reaches the hospital, you don't have sufficient health infrastructure to take care of the person. And you tell them to, OK, you have come about 20 kilometers. Now you move more for 20 kilometers and go to that particular hospital. And that particular doctor will be there. So that, that golden hour is lost in this whole scenario. Interestingly, when we went to the CHC, CHC is having a record of the dog bite, but they are not having any records of the snake bites. So what, what can we say? I mean, it was heartening for me that they don't have a single, uh, leave alone the death case, they don't record have, have a single snake bite case. So why tribes will be coming to the public health system? We need to think a lot and then accordingly plan our interventions to bring people out of that. Thank you. I think the next last slide is the thank you slide where I need to thank everybody, including ADN and all my collaborators and my participants, my fellow scientists here, and also my students who, who have worked in those areas and brought so much of wealth of data. Thanks a lot. Very nice, uh, uh, Dr. Nishant. That was really interesting. I really like this panel because we have, you know, the mixed group who can take from each other, who can learn from each other. And of course, um, after listening to Dr. Nishant, it is important to know that traditional healers, in especially in tribal areas, they, sh they should be included in the uh, medical health system. Thank you, Dr. Nishant. And uh, we have the next speaker, um, Dr. Suvindu Malik. And it is always uh, nice to here we have heard the scientists, we have heard the, uh, you know, the doctors, we have heard the social scientists. Now it is important to hear the uh, voices of the uh, snake helpline. So Mr. Malik is the general secretary at uh, snake helpline, a voluntary organization of the state of Odisha in the field of snake rescue and rehabilitation. He's a social worker and wildlife activist. Uh, the, Mr. Suvindu Malik, Please, uh, yeah. Thank you, Madhu. I will just add one sentence before Malik takes over. Whenever in Odisha, anywhere someone finds a snake inside the house, so we give a call to uh, Mr. Malik, snake helpline. So it would be really interesting to listen to him and learn from his past and experience. Over to you, Mr. Malik, please. <laughs> Uh, good evening, all, and good afternoon, also, participants from abroad. 
So I will be uh, focusing my observations on some loopholes, some uh, key errors that I have found in the protocols and uh, guidelines, which uh, I am putting forward in front of the eminent uh, panelists. They are uh, better thinkers than me. I am an activist, they are experts. So I hope uh, it will be. Uh, discussed in a much bigger platform. So I will look at that thing that this pressure immobilization method or popularly known as Sutherland method. So I will be discussing on that based on observations of uh, observations of uh, based of scientists. So thing is that yes please change it next the next slide please. Is switchable. Actually, as per WHO, first year should be like this, which it can be done by the victim himself or himself or herself. So he can, but the uh, demonstrations or the illustrations I found in WHO and uh, standard treatment by the government of India, this inserts of any, any wooden splint or anything, any rigid object, what they have uh, written is practically impractical, practically impossible, not at all feasible by a victim. Nobody, not a single man, cannot be able to tie a bandage and insert a splint in his, any limb, be it in, your, in his hand or be it in her leg. I'm showing it in a uh, different manner. Next, please. Please change this slide. The thing is that the same PIM, pressure removal method, was banned in the 2007 protocol of government of India. They have clearly banned it with due uh, proper evidences of research. They have uh, clearly banned in 2007. They said that pressure removal method is not applicable for the third world countries are developing countries like India. But unfortunately, what happened in 2016? Next. Next slide, please. Huh. But the thing is that this uh, wrapping of uh, uh, bandage and inserting a splint, this concept, uh, this concept has uh, made popular by herpetologists. However, this concept was published in a very the big journal, the Mega Journal Lancet, in the year 1979, uh, Sutherland and Air Cutler, Ar Harris, they published the article. And uh, after that, it was so popular, obviously, the journal Lancet is the one of the biggest journal uh, with having uh, much uh, higher imp uh, impact factor. So all of the public around the world, they tried to inculcate in this, uh, this method. Next. Next slide, please. If we discuss the results, what the results uh, Sutherland et al. found, they have used, they have studied 25 monkeys. And they say that the significant findings in 11 of those monkeys are detected below. They have, they have described only 11. They left 14 monkeys, which include non environmental and that took part in failed first aid experience will be reported how you have to report all these things you are reporting only selective selective findings which are supporting your hypothesis and you are not reporting it and another thing that the thing is that they are the monkeys were not anesthetized the monkeys were given venom injections without uh, applying anesthesia, which is in current scenario in 2022, no scientific experiment on monkeys will ever be passed, will ever be permitted by in the by the ethics committee by any university. You can name it. They are not going to pass the experiment where a monkey will be uh, subjected to environmental without anesthesia. Anyway, 
नेक्स्ट नेक्स्ट लाइन प्लीज सर व्हाट दे हैव सेड हाउ सदरलैंड एंड केमल सेशन दैट बैंडेज टेक्निक दे हैव यूज दे प्लैंक बिग प्लैंक वुडन प्लैंक and this this the uh, same uh, article was republished in another big journal wilderness and environment medicine by ian rogers and winkel so they have uh, uh, studied analyzed this article of uh, sutherland detail published in uh, uh, lancet and they heavily criticized it you can go through it it's a open paper on openly available not pay, 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 pay block so it openly available free article this is free article so you can read it and see the what they have criticized next let's please what they found what the lack of look look for they have found in the article please change this else huh. they said that without anesthesia cannot pass through ethics committee approval what they have said earlier selective reporting without setting reasons they have not seen in name yet certain any reasons why they have uh, see, why they have uh, they reject him or ignore the monkeys 25 monkeys they have presented only 11 results this is very surprising why and nobody answered them so nobody questioned them so the doctors rogers and winkel what they have observed absolutely correct and you also can study the doctors any memory doctors they can easily go through it they will know more i am not a doctor so my study my knowledge on this uh, uh, this uh, physiology is very li very limited so they will be commenting better next slide please ha huh. another this uh, article this uh, uh, press uh, this sutherland method was also criticized in the 2009 uh, pakistan snake bite protocol they made in pakistan they have clearly said in after a statistically insignificant trial that trial what was published in lancet was not at all statistically insignificant did not at all significant they carried out on 25 monkeys only 11 which are reported and on which only 3 are pm technique carried out that means out of 20 or 25 monkeys the actual pm technique was carried out on only 3 monkeys and the region why 14 monkeys were excluded from trial but never adequately explained they said which will be published later published later but in lancet said at the actual sutherland and sutherland et al they said that will be publishing later but no later no publication was there on this why they have left the 14 monkeys from the study what happened to them what result they got is there any negative result which were uh, contra contradictory to their findings that was never published so this that study was statistically insignificant next slide please so another thing this bmj british medical journal according to them ranging from fabrication to deceptive selective reporting willful suppression and distortion of data this is a this is called falsification of data which is called a very serious scientific misconduct so as per bmj if we say bmj is correct so this selective reporting by then publish uh, paper in the lancet it was now in on the current questionnaire you it will be termed as a scientific misconduct i am sorry to say that next slide please another thing that and most many studies are there after the uh, pm they say that even doctors forget about physician like people like us we are not do, do not we are not doctors even doctors who are trained and they have the medical degrees with them they are not able to apply the pressure measurement method properly one article published in wilderness and environment medicine another in transaction of royal society of tropical medicine and hygiene or both are big journals in the field of medicine and our stg talent in the government of india they said if the victim is expected to receive medical after more than 30 minutes should be after a qualified medical person only 
the snake bites in the field, rice field, the cultivated lands, the tree gardens. Dr. Puri said, Dr. Giri said, Dr. Singh said, it's a field, a occupational hazard. So where they will get, where they will get a medical professional who will be applying pressure immunology bandage. Another thing they said, if pain person is not present, don't do this. Why to go for it? When the same method was banned in the 2007 protocol, why they are advising the 2016 at all? This is now it is this is totally contradictory. Our protocol of standard treatment nine should be operated in a better way. But here we see that the same matter, the thing which is banned in 2007, but they did it from being promoted after 2016. How is it possible? Next slide. So another uh, laughable thing. The STD says at healthcare facility, first aid to be applied in the field on the way to the hospital. When they reach the healthcare facility, already maybe 30 minutes, maybe one hour, depending upon the distance from the right side to the hospital. When they reach the hospital, time to treatment. Doctors provide treatment. They do not provide first aid, but here this STD says at healthcare facility provide first aid measures and supportive measures immediately. How? Why? What, what, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? So this is STD should be clear cut, should be pinpoint, and should be uh, should be transparent. But here we see the our STD. Glamorizing pressure immunization method by Southern Land, which is a statistically insignificant article. And oh, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah. Next slide, please. Sorla. And see, see how impractical we are. This is from uh, the Pakistan. This is from Ambika Bhai. Sorry. You're, you're... Got muted. So, Ambika Bhai, can you unmute yourself, please? Okay. okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry, go okay. on. Last slide, please. Uh, yes. This is from Pakistan uh, protocol. They have uh, uh, used a bandage. See the lady. How much painful? Any person bitten by a snake. And when they reach with so much bandage covering on, what the doctor will see? What will the doctor, the, physician, the medical practitioner, receiving the patient in the casualty, the emergency section, what will, what will ask the lady? Show me your hand where the snake is biting. What is the bite mark? How will you open it? And suppose she or he will be reaching within 40 minutes or one hour with a condition bitten or, empty or tied up the such a bandage, will he able to work or will she able to work? So snake bite fasted by these protocols and all. Thing is that we have to be logical. There should be more and more studies on that. So this is purely hypothetical. I've been bitten by cobra 10 times and Russell viper one time. I've been bitten, I've been, been to ISIS five times. So I know little bit on snake bite, though I do not study snake bite. And I, my volunteers, we have trained them only to use bandages, no to use any splint. Because we do not find any logic behind it. The splint itself, as I have mentioned earlier, the splint concept was by Sutherland, which is a not a scientific study at all. Next slide, please. Next, last my slide. Huh. But this is uh, WHO. WHO also doing the same 
WHO inserted a plastic pipe, but Sutherland inserted a wooden plug. And uh, here WHO says you can use plastic pipe also. So there is nothing doing, there is no logic behind this. Next. More doctors are uh, thing that I have one time this is first picture. I have uh, I was bitten by Russell Viper. Just I have wrapped a crepe bandage. I have to be in ICU for three days. But I was safe and talking in front of you. The middle one also in 2010. Last time I was bitten by in 2010. I was alone then. I have now hundreds of bullet search inside in Odisha. So my workload is uh, lessened. So another thing, another my volunteer. So we never use any splint. And I never advise anybody to use splint. There is no need of use any splint. I have, yes, I have been taught by Dr. Singh and many doctors from Odisha. We used to talk to them. We used to collect uh, knowledge from them. And we simply pass on to the villagers or anybody. My job is only extension. I, though I have uh, many things to say, any from the field and snake bite, I choose this particular topic because experts from uh, along the across the globe from abroad and experts from uh, other states of police, uh, India also uh, present in this uh, meeting. So I use this opportunity to uh, highlight this issue. Please think of it. Please do proper research on this and please do not follow this Sutherland technique which was not based on scientific study as per many published articles. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you to you as well. So take it from here now. Thank you, Nibedita. And, uh, we do apologize. This is the first time we are doing it in hybrid mode, and that's definitely going to be a little bit of technical issues. So please be away, uh, bear with us. And I request is it Dilip Bhai to introduce Nimisha, Nimisha, our future leader. So it would be good to hear her work. So. So Ambika, are you introducing Nimisha or is it the lead? Okay, yeah, to crack uh, on. Uh, yeah. uh, good evening, everyone. Once again, welcome back. Uh, so, yeah, we now have uh, rightly shared by Madhu, a uh, boarding uh, researcher. Nimisha Goswami is a public health uh, specialist uh, in the India, India Liaison Office of University of Manitoba. Nimisa looks after various uh, maternal health and gender related projects in India and Africa. She also supports the Avoidable Death Network on global projects and events. With over 12 years of experience in public health, she has worked for organizations such as International Plant Parenthood Federation, American India Foundation, and the Ministry of Health in India. She holds an MA in social work from the prestigious Tata Institute of Social Sciences and also funded by the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission in the UK. Nimisa is pursuing her MSc in Risk Crisis and Disaster Management at the University of Leicester. So over to you, Nimisa. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Ambika ji, for the introduction. And I know that we are short on time today and I would not uh, you know, probably uh, take too much of time, but uh, I, I would just want to say that it's a privilege and absolute honor to really be presenting uh, in the middle of this expert panel. Uh, so thank you so much, Avoidable Deaths Network, to really give me this opportunity. I definitely feel like a future leader and a, definitely a budding researcher for sure, you know, and I, I must tell you that I have been citing some of you in my research study. So just imagine the honor that I have been feeling in terms of really presenting my MSc design uh findings uh you know in front of you all so uh yes i am a msc student with university of leicester risk crisis disaster management uh, in the school of business and currently uh writing my dissertation under the supervision of dr nivita ray bennett so yeah so just starting with uh my uh some of my dissertation findings can we just move ahead please 
So I would not already quite a lot of context have already been built in terms of you know what is there in terms of uh, the snake bite uh, prevalence, and we can see that India is actually uh, you know contributing to the half of the global snake bite deaths and is also responsible for almost 2.97 million deaths uh, uh, bites yearly, and also out of the eight uh, most vulnerable states, Orissa is one of them is is the fourth most snake bite prone, and we have seen that as per the, per a report. Um, annual report on natural calamities, we've seen that, uh, you know, uh, more than the other uh, natural disasters, you'd see cyclone, floods, lightning, it's snake bites, which is killing more people in Orissa. So we all know that uh, how vulnerable uh, the communities are there and also i mean it's kind of a dual vulnerability orissa i think you all have already spoken and you know you all know that it's already a disaster prone state so really to in the middle of it to really have snake bite as a as a public health issue but at the same time also a disaster is something which is attributing to more vulnerability to the community so uh it's it's certainly adding more uh burden uh of deaths in the you know in the state so just moving ahead so why causes and circumstances in terms of you know understanding the snake bite uh, you know deaths uh, in the community and primarily during during disaster because of course orissa was my state uh, and it's a disaster prone state and i was primarily really trying to understand you know what are some of the risk perception uh, how snake bites and uh, you know snakes are basically seen i think uh, dr nishant has spoken about it that how the, that whole attribution uh, of god you know vehicle of god and you know god uh, that whole uh, mahadev and you know having a uh, snake around his neck so that it, it is there's certainly an attribution of you know godliness to snake uh, which is which is i would say creating quite a bit of uh, issue in terms of you know perception and perception building and knowledge creation with regards to snakes and snake bites and we have seen that primarily because of these beliefs and cultural norms low resource settings are extremely vulnerable when it comes to snake bite uh, related deaths and also what i have seen a gender primarily working in the field of gender i felt that there are very few community based studies where gender has been actually spoken about in terms of how women are uh, vulnerable women girls disabled people are really vulnerable when it comes to snake bite deaths yes there are quite a few studies in terms of humanitarian setting in the context of disaster how women and girls are vulnerable but there are very few studies which which are being done in terms of seeing that uh, during snake during a disaster in terms of uh, you know snake Bites, are women and girls or the disabled community are they also vulnerable so these are some of the areas uh, where i i felt that there's certainly a gap in terms of you know while i was doing my literature review so hence um, i i uh, i conceptualized uh, my research questions in terms of uh, understanding the causes and circumstances of snake bite related mortalities during disasters and trying to primarily understand from the community's perspective what they really think how they really perceive uh, and also trying to see somewhere, somewhere uh, with the kind of time that I had and, you know, limitations that I had was also trying to really understand that how gender really plays a role. Please move ahead. Thank you. So in terms of method, of course, it's a qualitative study and uh, it was uh, based on case study design and my sample size was 30, out of which I, I did in-depth interview of 12 uh, snake bite survivors. They were actually bitten by snakes and they were the survivors of, of snake bites. And also I did um, FGDs, focus group discussions with uh, 15, uh, you know, community health workers, ASHAs, AN, ANMs, Gram Sevaks, VHS, VHSNC uh, members. So I did, uh, batches of three and five each so i did focus group discussion with them and also there were a few uh three informal interviews which were done during the course of uh data collection as i have already said the sample selection criteria was of course purposive and i interviewed the uh survivors um there were village development workers community health workers and also in terms of reviewing the documents of course with the existing documents uh, under the disaster management authority or isa state disaster management authority also i looked at some of the health Traded data in terms of what is really prevalent uh, in terms of snake bite mortality uh, in the block primarily. That's what I was uh, trying to really understand. And uh, in terms of field work, I conducted my field work in uh, two villages primarily, uh, Badi Nuapali and uh, Kendubari villages of Khalikod block uh, and Ganjam district. And my uh, primary methods were, of course, interview and of, uh, observations in the field. Just moving ahead. 
Uh, in terms of some of my findings when it comes to really causes and circumstances of snake bite treated mortalities in disaster and how really community perce perceived it, what I found is that out of the 12 survivors that I really interviewed, uh, five cases were reported to be non-venomous bites and seven were venomous bites. Uh, and five were sub suspected to be uh, bitten by cobra and two were Russell's viper. They were very, what I really felt, and as all the speakers have already talked about it, the community is quite aware of the snakes, uh, you know, which uh, which which are actually there in the in the village. So they, they already knew the typologies of snakes and, you know, which are venomous. So it, it is, I, I would say it's, a, again, a traditional knowledge of the community in terms of, you know, because they're, they're so kind of accustomed to living with snakes. Also, uh, in terms of the months, that the kind of timing that I saw was July to October was the kind of peak timing when there were quite a lot of reportage in terms of uh, snake bites and especially the monsoon season. All of them, all the survivors I talked to, um, and also the um, you know uh, also the health workers I talked to, they clearly talked about monsoon. They clearly talked about the period of July to October. And what I saw is that fifty per fifty eight percent of the snake bites were taking place in the daytime. Uh, and of course, outdoors was something which I really felt 67% uh, people were actually bitten uh, in the outdoors. And one of the most striking features that I really found, and I think uh, nobody's really spoken about it, and I found it pretty striking, uh, you know, kind of shocking, was that a lot of these women who were bitten in this, uh, bitten by snake, they were actually bitten in the outdoors while going to the toilets of their houses, which were constructed outside the house because of hygiene re reasons, because of you know all these, the kitchen and toilet should not be in the same kind of premises. So it, it was, it's the toilets are usually built outside. So a lot of women were actually getting uh, bitten while they were going, uh, you know, going to the toilet or taking taking their children to the toilet. So that's that's something which was pretty striking and shocking to me. And definitely I found some kind of a correlation with wash and kind of understanding that people have in terms of sanitation and hygiene. Of course, all, all the experts have really spoken about delaying seeking medical help because traditional healers are their first point of contact and they really, for the first aid and, and uh, the moment they're bitten, they, they have this, such a strong kind of inclination to go to the traditional healer. Um, and I think Dr. Nishant has spoken about it, how they're really respected in the community the, the the respect is immense so the 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 survivors even if they were facing complications, quite a few of them actually talked about complications after you know being given the drops through the nostrils and you know but still the 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 faith in the healer was immense which i found was like a, another like community perception which was there Again, so the, hence there were delay in terms of seeking tertiary and secondary care uh, in case there's a com uh, in case there's a complication. So the, the so this is also one of the causes in terms of really attributing to mortality, superstition and cultural beliefs. I think I've already started. Uh, you know, I started my talk by saying that there's certain kind of attribution to God and you know religious connotation. Go and there were quite a lot of superstitious beliefs that I really came across. Was like snakes can actually take revenge. There there are there is a male snake and a female. Male snake, the female can actually come back and can really avenge the death of the male snake. So there were quite a lot of uh, superstitions which are there prevalent in the community and taken pretty seriously. And lack of snake uh, rescuers, um, maybe all of you can provide more information on that. And I'm really noting that down. What I really found is that the out-of-pocket expense of some of the survivors was pretty high. And calling while they know that at the backyard there's a snake, calling snake rescuers was was more of a kind of a dicey situation because they are expensive and they are part of the informal sector and they're all private rescuers some of them are not trained they did not know how to really deal with the snake probably they will just pick it up with the lati and put it in the so they were kind of like informal sector and so did so and also they were charging pretty much and during disasters really accessibility mobility is another issue so really there was kind of a lack of snake rescuers in order to really help the community in terms of you know rescuing them in case there's a snake at the backyard or in the in their house in the houses and as i've already spoken about wash practices yes there they, i saw that you know there were quite a lot of issues with regards to accessing the toilets outside and so the, it was attributing to cases for sure it is it was one of the circumstances which was really attributing to such cases and then 
uh, again, I think most of most of you have already spoken about humidity, moisture, and snakes. You know, being in the roof, mud houses, kacha houses, and really, uh, you know, being in the walls and trying to really search for foods, rodents, rats is something which was uh, which was also attributing to a lot of cases of uh, snake bite. Please, next slide. Just moving ahead, uh, my another part of the question in terms of research question in terms of really trying to see gender, but I, I would say it was a kind of a limitation because of course the sample size was not so representative. I did not have so much time, but it's an area that definitely needs further work in terms of really seeing how women and girls in terms of the wash is issues, in terms of really taking care of the children. A lot of them were housewives. I think five of them were already housewives and staying. They were bitten inside their house houses. So what really makes them more vulnerable in terms of you know snake bites so uh, i've spoken about it i think toilets going outside the accessibility issue was something which was there and 33 percent of snake bite survivors were bitten inside the houses of women and rest were actually accessing toilets so i would say that there's cert certainly some kind of a correlation when it comes to gender and makes them more vulnerable and i also tried to see the government data um, the dghs data in terms of trying to see that you know for calicoat block um, i was doing my study in july and trying to see like a six month data and i could see that 16 male were reported to be uh, during the period of six months 16 there were uh incidents incidents of snake bite among 16 males and 15 females and one there was one reported death which was a female so again the causes have to be probably uh, you know, we'll have to find out more in terms of, and I would say there's a lot of uh, unreported, undocumented cases because a lot of them are also going to the traditional healers. So, so how many of those cases are really getting documented is again questionable. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, next slide, please. So based on my uh, study, Thank you so much. So based on my study in terms of really trying to find out the causes and circumstances and looking at it from the gender lens, I really felt and I'm happy to know that, uh, you know, some of you have actually talked about IEC materials, information, education, communication materials, local at the local context, how they really made, but probably a some bit of uh, study or mapping needs to be done in terms of the cultural beliefs and practices, how those can be really addressed when it comes to information and per perception regards to, regards to a snake bite. Uh, also, communication between CHC, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Giri also talked a little bit about, uh, you know, CSC, getting them trained, the medical officers in the CSC, doctors getting trained, and, you know, how do they really administer the antivenom? So, I feel that there's certainly a communication between CSC, district hospital, and the traditional healers, if it is possible, is needed so that at least the cases are documented at least there's a definite linkage can be built between the traditional healers for tertiary care or complications that that would be really important and that can be something maybe like more of an immediate uh, kind of a priority even if not long term uh, robust intervention by district administra administration and block development office uh, with community practitioners such as traditional healers they call them sakwa kera and snake rescuers is critical. That's that's what I felt that, you know, the healers need to be definitely mapped and captured. And, you know, they, they, there's some kind of an intervention is definitely required with the traditional healers. And lastly, I think sensitization. I'm really happy that there's a lot of work going on with regards to community-based sensitization, you know, sensitizing the leaders. So uh, that that is something which I think in the long run would definitely do a lot of mind shift and do a lot of, uh, you know, knowledge building in terms of understanding of snake bite rated mortalities and mixed methods. I would say research is something, uh, you know, understanding it from the community perspective. A lot of study has been done in the hospital premises and, you know, training of the service providers. But from the community perspective, what they really think, how those kind of perceptions can be addressed is important. And definitely gender is something that needs to be further seen uh, in the longer term. Thank you so much. So this is this is from my side. Yeah. Thank you so much. And yeah, this is the photo that we had taken there in the village with the ASHA, AMs, and uh, the Gram Sevak and the ward members. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for your time and patience. Thank you. For the research, I uh, would be really uh, happy to host you in Odisha because Odisha has been doing a lot of uh, work on the disaster resilience 
and uh, ADN has been uh, trying a lot of ideas in Odisha. So we would love to host you anytime you plan to come to Odisha. So we'll be there providing you research support and uh, we can go to the interior parts, learn from the communities and you can always guide us to save the lives of the people where we have been experiencing close, closely 200 deaths because of non-availability or access to such services. So with these words, uh, I think this is a great uh, initiative and to begin with and uh, as uh, Dr. Nibedita and Idu has rightly uh, established this outfit uh, avoidable death network. So with the contribution of all you knowledge workers, we are going to make this art a better place to live and have high hopes to, to do it much better. Thank you all and thank you for giving us uh, the opportunity to host this event. Thank you all and Namaste from India. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.